All right, so uh, welcome back. How's everything going? Everybody uh, doing okay? I know uh, it's been a big adjustment for me, but ready to go. So we're going to start into the material for exam three today. We're going to be talking about ecology, geography, and then getting into biostratigraphy. So we spent the first part of the class talking about kind of things at like uh, individual species level and we're going to kind of move towards more like a community level and ecosystem level moving a little bit higher up the hierarchy but before we do that a couple housekeeping items so so with that said let's go ahead and get into some new material so before we talk about paleoecology we should probably talk about what ecology is so ecology is basically just the relationship between organisms and their environment. And it's a two-way street, so it's how the environment affects the organisms, but also how the organisms affect the environment. And remember that we humans, we are organisms as well, so we are part of this ecology. And this really started increasing as a thing uh, in the, in the uh, 1900s with the uh, conservation effort and the environmental movements. So sees things like this, so like save our cities, save our soil, save our air. All these reports of like rivers catching on fire, uh, not ideal. <laughs> so fortunately we cleaned up a lot of that stuff. Uh, a lot of smog issues have been kind of alleviated. Obviously it's not where we'd like it to be, but ecology really came to the forefront with the environmental movement. Um, a lot of college protests, especially like Berkeley, were kind of the centers for this. So young people really pushed this movement of becoming aware of basically how we as organisms are impacting our environment and then obviously that impacts us back if we pollute our environment it affects us in ways as well so that's ecology and obviously this is paleontology class so we're going to talk about ecology in the past which is called paleoecology so paleoecology, relationship between ancient organisms and their environment. It's really kind of where paleo, the stuff that we've been talking about, and said strat, the stuff that we talked about you know, last semester, it's really where these things kind of come together. So hopefully you remember this figure here from earlier in the course, where we've got the life assemblage, the life community, this is what paleoecology is after. We're trying to kind of reassemble this life assemblage, and we're doing that from, remember, not even actually the death assemblage, because we don't actually even see the death assemblage, because some of it doesn't make it into the fossil record. Of the stuff that does make it into the fossil record, a lot of that is destroyed along the way, and even less of it is actually observed and collected. So we're trying to reconstruct this vibrant living community of diverse organisms from only what's recorded in the fossil record, this very small sliver. Obviously that's a bit challenging. So take a look at this picture over here. Take a look at this. This is a Cambrian environment here, reflecting organisms from the Burgess Shale. Take a look at some of those organisms there. Which ones are probably not going to be represented in the fossil record? So I'll give you a couple seconds to take a peek at that. Look at all the different various critters there. Think about their structure. Think about their morphology. What are they made out of? What's their life habit? How robust are they? So what do you think? Looking at that picture there. Hmm. Well, one thing that you probably thought about up here, these jellyfish, they do not have any hard parts. They're part of the community. They're probably a rather important part of the community. They will not make it into the fossil record. Uh, these trilobites, trilobites, arthropods, remember they shed their exoskeletons. They may be actually overrepresented in the community because they're producing several different copies of themselves throughout their lifetime. Sponges here, big hard parts, spicules, 
Um, they'll probably be disaggregated into their parts, but they'll probably be represented. So there's a lot of different things that go into uh, reconstructing this. You're trying to reconstruct this life assemblage from the flawed fossil record. And at the same time, we're trying to reconstruct the paleo environment. So for those of you that were in sedimentology stratigraphy last semester, we know the challenges that go into that. So taking a look at our grain size, our grain texture, our grain shape, our sorting, our sedimentary structures, uh, what environment was this? So let's walk, you walk up to a shale on an outcrop. Uh, is this a ancient lagoon, a low energy like back reef? Is this deep basinal shale? What was this paleo environment? And so when we are able to reconstruct the living community from the fossil record, and we're able to kind of back out the depositional environment, this is really paleoecology. It's where these two things are, are coming together. And as you know, since we've discussed it, <laughs> and we've been discussing it, there are a lot of uncertainties in both of these things, which complicates matters pretty dramatically. So probably one of the cooler things with paleoecology is that you get these paleoecological reconstructions. So there are these pretty pictures, very neat, very cool. They show the paleo community as it existed at the time that it existed within its environment. So for example, this over here, this is a view of what things might have looked like in the Ordovician. We've got trilobites, we've got brachiopods, we've got a cephalopod predator and a straight shelled cephalopod, orthoconic cephalopod, swimming around, chewing on all these things. We've got a gastropod there crawling around. Uh, and these things are shown in their life positions, uh, what they looked like with their soft parts while they were living, an attempt to really just give you a look at what the what these things probably looked like. This one over here is a reconstruction of a Silurian environment. So we've got our good friends here, uh, Favocytes, the tabulate coral, Halicytes, the chain coral. We've got some sea lilies, the crinoids, filter feeding in here. We usually see these as those fossil Cheerios disaggregated completely. But on this reconstruction, you see it's got that nice filter feeding calyx to kind of reach up under the water column and pull food out. We've still got these orthocoencephalopod predators. We've got some of these branching bryozoans, very delicate, usually broken up. But you can see everything's kind of been restored into its life position. What did this thing look like with the biases of a fossil record removed? All of the biases of the soft hard parts versus hard parts, the taphonomic processes, all that's been removed to kind of reconstruct what this environment looked like. And the other thing that we have to ask ourselves really is, okay, we've reassembled this living community, this, this life assemblage. How did they interact with each other? What was going on? Who was chasing who? Who was digging around in the soil? Who was swimming in the water column? What were these critters doing when they were alive? So let's take a look at these pictures real quick. And remember, we're trying to remove the biases of the fossil record here. What do you notice about this? Do you think they did a good job with that? These are sort of older reconstructions from like the 70s and 80s, uh, sort of at the forefront of doing this for the first time. I know one thing that kind of sticks out to me is that it's all the hard part organisms. Uh, it doesn't look like they did a very good job of kind of backing out the biases in the fossil record here, and that's always going to be a challenge. There are probably entire species that are just not represented because they wouldn't be preserved. A lot of times all we see left over are burrows and traces, so remember that as we're reconstructing these paleo communities that some of these organisms are just not represented. They're not going to be shown in the fossil record and then it's going to make it very hard. There's probably entire tiers of that food pyramid that are just not present and we have to kind of look at 
Well, what do we have to do? We've talked about it before. So you look at modern analogs, we know kind of given ratios of kind of what things should exist in the community. We kind of look at what's filling what niches and that's kind of what we'll be talking about for the rest of the day today here. But, you know, pretty neat, pretty cool to look at. A nice little glimpse into the past. So there are two main subdivisions within paleoecology. And one is aut ecology, which is basically looking at the behavior of an individual organism, its relationship to its environment. And this probably sounds a little bit familiar to you because it's essentially functional morphology, which we talked about last week. Well, two weeks ago now. Feels like forever ago. Um, but anyway, so here's a brachiopod. Remember, it's a loaf of four, eight, loaf of four, eight. So it has this coiled filtering device, the loaf of four inside its shell. Look at these two pictures here. On this one, it has inflow from the water column coming in the sides of the shell. And then the fold and sulcus of the shell that we talked about kind of using it to funnel wastewater out. So remember these are, these organisms have a, a, a U-shaped gut. Stuff comes in one end, goes out another end. There is flow differentiation here so that the out doesn't go back in the end. We do not want that. Um, on this one, in on the sides, out between the fold and sulcus, on this model here, flow in is through the fold and sulcus, and then out through the lophophore, filtered out through there. Th again, this is kind of a problem here, right? So we're trying to study the behavior of these individual organisms and how they interact with their environment. In a lot of cases, it's uncertain. We have the final fossil. We have the hard part shell. Uh, in rare cases, we have the internal pieces like this is a very ridiculously good preservation here with some of the internal parts. How did this stuff actually work? Well, remember we talked about functional morphology. You can just construct a model, try to see how it works. We can look at modern analogs, see how it works. But at the end of the day, maybe we don't know. There's still a little bit of debate about which of these models is right. So. Interesting. The next one is synecology, which is the ecology of a community of organisms and their relationships to the environment. So this is sort of a modern coral reef environment. And we know just how diverse these coral reef environments are and how complicated the interactions with the organisms are. So like think about like clownfish. Uh, clownfish shelter themselves in the anemones. Anemones? Anem anemones? Anemones, that's the one. Yeah, we got it. Uh, clownfish shelter themselves in there, and there's kind of that symbiotic relationship. Uh, that sort of complicated relationship is probably lost when you go into paleoecology. We don't get that level of understanding of how these things interacted with each other. Um, stuff like Zoxanthelli living in the soft tissues of corals and that, that symbiosis. Again, uh, soft tissues not, preser not preserved things inside soft tissue certainly not preserved. That relationship, not preserved. We wouldn't be able to analyze that in paleoecology. So a lot of things are complicating our study here. We're probably not seeing a complete picture. It makes it incredibly difficult to reconstruct. And I think it just speaks to the complexity of, of these communities and the complex ways that they interact with their environment. Even in modern, situations where we're able to actually go out and observe directly, it is still difficult to determine this complicated web of interweaved, interwoven relationships. So when we're attacking this problem, we kind of think about it with this sort of hierarchy. So from the top down, up here we have biosphere, all living organisms on Earth. Talking about ecology at this level is uh, sort of not very useful. It's just everything. So everything, everywhere, every living thing in the sky, in the land, in the ocean, all of the life's creatures, 
down to the next level, we have like ecosystems. So ecosystems are like large scale associations of organisms with common environmental factors. So if you're familiar with the Planet Earth series, pretty cool, go check it out. <clears throat> so they do like a, a rainforest episode and like an oceans episode, a deserts episode, uh, I think a tundra episode. Those are ecosystems. So they're these large, very large scale, kind of global scale bands of very similar environmental factors. Don't necessarily host the same organisms, but they probably host similar organisms. And then moving down another level, we've got a community. So local associations of organisms. So maybe a forest, or even a particular part of a forest, or an ocean, or an individual little basin within that ocean. And then getting a little bit more specific, we've got habitats and niches. So habitats are the actual location where an organism lives, an individual organism lives, and then a niche is the role that that organism fills. So a lot of people kind of try to frame this as habitat is the organism's address, kind of where it lives, where it hangs out. And then a niche is kind of what it does, like its job, what's its occupation? How does this organism actually like live and interact with its environment on a daily basis? So for example, here are these birds, which we'll revisit in detail a little bit later, these warblers, their habitat is a spruce tree. They, they live in spruce trees and their niches is basically feeding on insects in various parts of these trees. So that's kind of the hierarchy, again, working your way up from the big down to the small. And we've spent a lot of time talking about species and populations and evolution within those. And now we're starting to move up the ladder. We're starting to talk about communities. We're starting to talk about ecosystems. Uh, we're probably not gonna really talk about the biosphere itself, but I guess we sort of do with, you know, diversity curves, things like that. But basically ecology is kind of moving up the ladder to the larger scale things and how organisms are actually interacting with their environment. So what are some things that really matter here? So I said that ecosystems are these like large scale bands of common environmental factors, which probably host maybe not the same again, but pretty similar organisms. So we've got a lot of these different factors here. These are the kind of the five big hitters that sort of differentiate these, these ecosystems from each other. So temperature is a big one. So temperature impacts physiology. So we talked about, remember how organisms like sizes and shapes would change with increasing or decreasing temperature. Think back to that lumpties video, uh, the big, tall, lanky lumpties in the hot environments. They're trying to increase their surface area to get rid of heat. And then the stockier, shorter lumpties, a little bit more furry, uh, trying to keep in their heat so temperature matters a lot for physiology. It matters a lot for morphology. It matters a lot for physical traits. Uh, and it also matters a lot for metabolism. So how, how this organism is using energy. And temperature changes. And again, we're going to be mostly talking about the marine environment here because the fossil record, the rock record really, again, is incredibly biased towards marine where stripping things off of the land mostly and putting them into basins. The rock record is biased towards being preserved in those basins there. Um, so temperature changes with depth in the water column and it also changes with latitude. So in general, as you get deeper, you get colder. And in general, as you get closer to the equator, you get hotter. As you get closer to poles, you get colder. And you can see that this temperature has a dramatic impact on paleo environment, or sorry, paleoecology. So like, for example, the dark green band here are radiolarians. So radiolarians, those silicious plankton that we talked about, they prefer warm and diatoms, 
the silicious phytoplankton, they prefer colder environments. And so we get this kind of, these kind of like bands. Uh, Oxygen is also important, very important. Oxygen is critical for respiration. It also changes with depth, but it also changes with mixing. So in areas, generally, you know, the, the atmosphere has a lot of oxygen. The water doesn't necessarily have a lot. Kind of at that interface, there is exchange. And the more the water is mixed, the, the more the oxygen is moved around. The more that the water is stagnant, the less that oxygen moves around, the less those nutrients move around. And uh, so mixing can be a, a very important factor as well. So like in areas of upwelling, uh, you're able to get a lot more of that stuff in the water column. Salinity is another one. Uh, it controls osmotic pressures within an organism. So if you're a saltwater organism, the interior of your body is probably less salty than the environment. And so if you're a freshwater, the interior body is probably actually more salty. And so that differential there drives osmosis across their membranes. And it's controlled by precipitation where there's in areas where there's more precipitation, uh, surface sea salinities are a little bit lower. In areas where there's a lot of evaporation, for example, in the like the horse latitudes, the desert belts of the earth where there's more evaporation than precipitation, the salinities are a little bit higher. And then where there's a lot of runoff, so like at mouths of rivers, at uh, glacial outputs, where you're putting a lot of fresh water in, the salinities are a little bit lower. So those kind of things impact salinity. And of course, mixing also determines that as well. Depth is also a key factor. Uh, depth is a big one for differentiating ecosystems in the marine environment. Depth controls the available light. So at the very top, say like the upper, like 100 to 200 meters, uh, that's the photic zone. Lots of lights able to penetrate. That's where those phytoplankton, the, the plant plankton, the autotroph plankton, they're making energy in the vibrant sunlight. As you go downwards through the water column, less and less stuff, less and less lights able to penetrate. And eventually you get down into the aphotic zone. And this is that cool area where, you know, like anglerfish with that cool lantern on their heads, all the bioluminescence, all those neat little critters like that. Um, there's no light down there. So how does that affect organisms? How does that affect how they live? How does that affect what they do? Pressure also increases. So pressure increases quite a lot. So think about the Marianas Trench. Uh, only really James Cameron and his cool little sub of being able to get down there because of the immense pressure is down there. Organisms have to deal with that as well. Uh, temperature and oxygen are also controlled by depth. And then the CCD that we talked about a little bit earlier, and we definitely talked about in sedimentology and stratigraphy, the carbonate compensation depth. So that's the area below where calcite dissolves. And that's controlled by depth. So that remember that marine snow that accumulates on the high peaks, that's the underwater peaks, controlled by depth. And then substrate, what the, what the surface was. So that controls your burrowing strategies. Critters have a much harder time burrowing in a rocky environment than they do in a muddy environment. It controls the kind of burrows that you'll see. Uh, it controls the kind of encrusting strategies. So like a lot of organisms need to encrust on hard, rocky substrates. If it's a muddy substrate, they're not going to be able to live. It also controls the burial rates. So think about like a, a very sandy environment with a lot of clastic input. An organism that doesn't have a mechanism to clean itself off is going to get buried really quickly. So substrate, whether you've got a rocky substrate, a muddy substrate, a sandy substrate, that's going to really control how organisms are able to interact with their environment. And there's a little asterisk here because again, thinking back to Paleo, paleoecology, we are looking at the rock record. We're looking at the fossil record. How do we get to these factors? Well, substrate's the only one that we can directly observe. 
So we look at the rock, presuming that that's the sediment that they were actually living and engaging with in life. Um, there are instances where organisms are transported out of their environment, so all bets would be off at that point. But presuming that the organisms are preserved uh, essentially in life position, or at least in their life assemblage, um, that's the one that we can look at. We can see like, oh, okay, well, this was a hard, this was a hard ground, or or this was a a sandy bottom, or this was a muddy bottom. It's the only one of these factors that we can really get to temperature. There's a couple things we can look at. Again, we can look at the morphology of the creatures because we kind of know some patterns to get like a proxy for temperature. Oxygen, in some cases, we can look at isotopes. Salinity, again, we can kind of look at chemistry, but depth. So depth's very important. We can look at sedimentary structures to try to infer depth, but pretty difficult. So when you're studying paleoecology, these five factors, pretty tricky. So another concept here is food web. We've talked about this a little bit before. Food web's a very important aspect. It basically shows the energy flow within an ecosystem. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the food chain. Food chain is a little bit uh, oversimplified. It sort of implies this like linear up and we know that it's a lot more complicated than that. But basically this food web is, is essentially who, who's eating who? Where's the energy moving through the system? So at the bottom here, we have non-living things, nutrients. We also have non-living thing, light. You take some nutrients, you take some light, you get some photosynthesis, and you get these green plants. In the marine ecosystems, those green plants are the phytoplankton, so your diatoms, things like that. The next level up are the herbivores, the things that eat those. And then you've got all these other various components going on here. So there's been a lot of attempts to sort of like look at ancient environments and try to reconstruct their food web. And again, remember how many assumptions are going into this, but we have sort of the same model. We kind of assume that the present is the key to the past. So how do you reconstruct an ancient food web? You look at modern food webs and you sort of try to assign roles to these ancient creatures. So like down here, this is for an Ordovician reconstruction. Uh, nutrients, that probably didn't change. The bottom of the food chain are these inorganic nutrients, light, things like that phytoplankton, utilizing the zooplankton, feeding on the phytoplankton. The first level up on the chain here are the filter feeders. Today, oceans are dominated by corals and bivalves. Not really the case in the Ordovician. Sponges and stromatoporoids, much more important. Brachiopods, a lot more important than they are now. Crinoids, they're everywhere. Corals are there. Uh, in general, they're the kind of solitary rugose corals, but uh, they are present. They're just a relatively minor part. So remember the organisms that fill these niches, fill these roles, changes through time. We've got trial bites kind of scavenging around, skittering through the mud, filter feeding, or I should say deposit feeding out of the mud. We've got gastropods kind of grazing around, eating algae, maybe even boring in the skeletons, boring in the shells. And then we've got at the top here, the apex predator of the Ordovician, the orthocone nautilus. So we've seen some shells of these things. One of the specimens that we looked at in lab was like that big, but it was only a small part. Uh, some of these things can get quite large. Um, they are the apex predators of the Ordovician. Uh, really, not a lot of apex predators. You'll notice, so think about like a modern ocean. Think about, we've got orca, sharks, dolphins. We've got all these various wide diversity of, of high level predators that didn't really exist back here. So we're gonna talk a little bit next class about some changes that we've seen through time with environments. And, and that's kind of one of them is like kind of a more 
diversity, more array of apex predators, and uh, just some sort of interesting changes through time. So talking about these trophic groups, we talked about food web. There's also kind of this concept of the food pyramid. So we've talked about, you know, at the bottom, you should have a nice wide base, the primary producers. And then as you move up towards the apex predators, energy is lost at every step. And so there are, there's less and less biomass as you move up. And there's less and less individuals as you move up. That's not always exactly true. So like, for example, this here is an example that shows, OK, this is a food pyramid that we would sort of expect. We've got this wide base of P as producers. Above that, we've got this slightly less wide base, well, substantially less wide base of herbivores that feed on those producers. C is the consumers, and then these are the top carnivores. And so you see the wide base tapering to the top, kind of what we'd expect. Decomposers are over here. They're kind of just feeding on everything once it's kind of served its purpose and croaked. Um, so this is kind of what we'd expect. But looking at some modern environments, some modern environments, particularly marine environments, uh, we can actually get this kind of like upside down pyramid, which when you think about it initially doesn't really make a lot of sense. So for example, Long Island Sound biomass of the phytoplankton is about half that of the biomass of the zooplankton. So the zooplankton and the bottom fauna, the benthic filter feeders, they're feeding on this phytoplankton, but there's about half of that with respect to their biomass. So how does that work? Well, think about like growth rates. So think about how long an apex predator lives. Think about how long an herbivore lives versus how long an individual phytoplankton might live. So these phytoplankton are relatively low in numbers, but as they're cold, they're replaced very rapidly. And so this allows us to have this sort of like upside down pyramid and the whole thing doesn't topple over because, you know, think about Jenga, you remove a block, imagine you just put it right back. And this is kind of a schematic here, you know, primary production phytoplankton in the water column, shallow in the water column generally, or also maybe some growing right on the sea surface and relatively shallow waters, or sorry, sediment surface. Herbivores feeding on that, deposit feeders, and then we've got the suspension feeders, carnivores, and then we also see kind of these life site activities. So there's in fauna, things that live in the sediment, shallow and deep in fauna. These guys are slightly low in the sediment. These are deeper. There's epifauna, things that are right on the sediment. And then there's the plankton and the nekthos that are you know swimming or floating in the water column. So there's kind of this like 3D aspect to the environment. So why do we have niches? Why are there different roles within a community? So the whole reason here is that if there's a lot of different organisms, they're competing for limited resources. There's only so much food present in this particular ecosystem. So if everyone's trying to get their fair share, it's best if they avoid direct competition with each other for these limited resources. So, you know, think about toilet paper right now. Toilet paper is a limited resource. Uh, if we were somehow to avoid competition to it, like say a lot of people in a lot of other countries have bidets, uh, they're not necessarily fighting for the toilet paper resources. So this is, a really neat example here of some different birds that coexist within the same community. And, you know, superficially, okay, they're birds and they're digging stuff out of the dirt or eating plants right in the dirt. And we would kind of think, well, oh, okay, well, they're, they're fighting for the same resources. But if you look at it a little bit closer, and again, this is very easy to do with a modern environment where we can go directly observe 
a lot harder to do with an ancient environment, uh, we can see that they're actually behaving quite differently or doing things quite differently. So like the flamingos with their long legs and long neck, they kind of dig into the sediment, kind of shake their heads around and filter stuff out with their filter feeding beaks. They're exploiting things in the slightly deeper water and exploiting things kind of in the mud. The ducks dive down, they're exploiting things that are kind of on top. In most cases, just on the top, the, the, the epifauna. Uh, these avocets, they're feeding on things kind of in the shallower water. They're not able to reach deeper like the flamingos. Oyster catchers tend to be in the really shallow water and they're going after the bivalves in the sediment. And then the plovers are kind of chasing around stuff that's on the sediment. So superficially, it looks like hey, these critters are all fighting for the same resources, but they're really not. They're all filling different roles. Uh, and at the risk of letting my nerd flag fly, uh, think about an RPG. So an RPG, a party is much more effective when it's balanced. So like, say like a tank and maybe some ranged throwers, uh, wizards, something like that. <laughs> um, but like, so the joke here, like the Hobbit, so the party bounce, there's 13 dwarven fighters, a halfling thief, and a wizard whenever he feels like it. So there's 13 fighters fighting for the same role, fighting for the same item drops, fighting for the same kills. Communities try to avoid that by filling different niches, trying to find kind of balance. There is only so much resource to go around everyone wins when you're able to kind of share, I suppose, is a good way of looking at it. Uh, another thing that we're able to do is resource partitioning. So organisms within a community, they might also exploit the same resource, that same limited resources, uh, but they might do it in different ways. So niche partitioning, things we're exploiting slightly different resources. Resource partitioning is exploiting the same resource, but in a different way. So one cool example of this are these warblers. And again, looking at these warblers, look at their beaks. Their beaks are very similar. Look at their morphology. Their morphology is very similar. The only real difference is their coloring. Uh, I'm actually not sure if that's significant or not. Um, I'm not an ornithologist, but interesting nonetheless. Not preserved in the fossil record, though. But Pretty interesting. Looking at these birds, they're superficially very similar. They do very similar things. They eat insects in spruce trees. But to partition that resource, so they're avoiding competition with each other, avoiding fighting over those individual resources, they exploit, in general, different parts of the spruce tree. And so they come into a lot less direct competition with each other, a lot less squabbling. So like, think about countries. Uh, borders are a somewhat artificial concept, but it kind of helps us from squabbling over resources. Uh, obviously, we still fight over borders and we still fight over resources, but probably a little bit less so when we know that, well, this over here is this country, this over here is this country, these are my resources, these are your resources. Uh, it kind of helps to kind of sort of lessen that fighting, that squabbling, that back and forth. It makes life a little bit easier for everyone, unless, of course, you're on the other side of the resource equation. So these are sort of exploiting resources in different places. There's also this concept of exploiting resources at different times. So think about a hawk. This hawk has caught a delicious mouse. Nom, 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 nom. This owl has also caught a mouse. The hawks are hunting during the day. The owls are hunting at night. They're fighting for the same resources, but they're not fighting for it at the same time. So they're not really in direct competition with each other. Bad day to be a mouse looks like there. And I don't know if it's ever a good day to be a mouse. But let's see. Another common concept in ecology is this idea of community succession. So community succession are these regular changes that take place in a community as it matures, as it establishes itself and matures. So think about like going from bare exposed rock, so like a lava flow or a landslide or something completely strips or a fire, completely strips the vegetation 
and then the community rebounds, but it doesn't do so right away. It does so in stages, right? So we start with exposed rock, and then the first thing to move in, the pioneer species, are like lichens and mosses and ferns. So remember, we talked about mass extinctions. One of the first things that we see moving in after a mass extinction are ferns. The large plants are, 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 are dramatically reduced, and we're sort of starting over from scratch, and we see the lichens and mosses and ferns sort of moving in first. Then we move up into annual weeds, sort of perennial weeds and grasses. Then we up into shrubs, sort of young pine forest, scrubby pine forest, and then into like a very mature kind of broadleaf forest. So this is a very well-established progression. We're able to see this. And it's actually even a way that we can sort of even date these events with this progression. So this is down here is an example of a lava flow in Reunion Island. This is the lava flow that happened in 2004. And I'm not exactly sure when this picture was, but it's probably shortly after 2004. Uh, you can see that the surface is pretty barren. There's not a lot going on. Uh, there are some things starting to populate in the cracks. In 2000, a lava flow that happened in 2002, slightly older, that lava flow surface is a little bit more weathered, a little bit more degraded, and you see that these lichens and mosses and ferns are starting to populate the surface a little bit. A lava flow in 1998, a little bit older than that even, we're starting to get sort of these grasses and weeds. One that happened in 1986, even older, the whole surface is starting to be kind of populated here. Something that is about 100 years old, sort of almost progressing to the shrub stage or the young pine forest, and then something that's about 300 years old has gone all the way through to the full-on forest stage. Uh, so we can actually use this well-established progression to date geologic features. A uh, young lava flow is going to have a barren, rocky surface with essentially no plant life. And an older lava flow might be severely degraded and actually hosting now a full-on forest environment. So thinking about these timescales here, progressing here in like year, maybe like decade, decade, century, a couple centuries, do you think that this progression, this succession would be recognizable in the fossil record? So think about the sedimentary record, think about bedding, think about how much time an individual bed represents. Do you think that we're able to see this? Uh, probably not. So a lot of studies sort of start attributing changes in the ecology to this idea of succession, but succession probably happens too quickly. We're probably not able to actually see that in the fossil record. So think about not only just the preservation biases, but also the time biases. Uh, unfortunately, reading the fossil record, reading the rock record, is like reading a novel with a bunch of the pages ripped out. We're missing time, we're missing things. So this is really hard. Why should we bother? Why would we do this? Uh, we've seen a lot of the challenges that it offers. Why bother? Well, it's really neat to get a little peek at an ancient environment. What was life like in the Ordovician? So thinking about rocks around here, uh, going to an exposure, you're the first one that's seen that exposure in some cases. Um, light has not shined on those rocks in hundreds of millions of years. What was that like when it was actually a thriving, living community? What was going on? Who was eating who? Who was digging around? Who was swimming around? What did it look like? So when we put this all together and we make these reconstructions, they look cool. They're neat. Uh, I like looking at those, all those artistic renderings of what life was like. Uh, but we need to remember that in the end, it's based on a lot of assumptions. In a lot of cases, some very valid assumptions, very safe assumptions. Uh, in a lot of cases, in other cases, maybe not. So Stephen Jay Gould has this quote here, reconstruction community sounds like the right thing to do. But where does it all lead and why is it being done? Suppose that we could proceed unambiguously. Now remember, that's a trick, right? So figuring out the entire living assemblage unambiguously, 
figuring out the environment unambiguously. We could then enumerate taxa. We could see every creature that was living there, every organism, determine the relative abundance, assign all their trophic roles on the food pyramid, and calculate their biomass. Uh, let's say that we could do that. And again, we've talked this whole lecture about all the challenges with that. Uh, at the end, we probably decide that ancient communities worked much like modern ones. Does that help us at all? Like, did we ever really doubt that? Again, one of the key things in geology, uniformitarianism, the present's the key to the past. Okay, ancient communities worked the same way that modern ones do, probably. Uh, essentially, our reconstructions of ancient communities are based on that assumption. So, of course, that's what we're going to think. So, maybe we shouldn't really be doing that all that much. Maybe we shouldn't be focusing so much on, on reconstructing environments for the sake of reconstructing environments. Next class, we're going to talk about evolutionary paleoecology. So, if it's not helpful to do that, why study it at all? Well, again, just like with evolution, where the fossil record captures macroevolution, things like speciation, higher level evolution that we can't observe directly in biology, paleontology is the only way to look at that. Macro, so thinking about ecology, scale that up to the macro, scale it up to global scale, scale it up to millennia, millions of years, what are the changes in ecology? What are the changes in environment? How do things change over time? That's a little bit more useful and a little bit more interesting. And so in a lot of ways, evolutionary paleoecology is somewhat like macroecology and in, a lot, in some cases actually referred to as such. Uh, but it's just this higher level, global scale, long time scales that we just can't do with modern ecology, modern biology, looking at modern systems. And then we're going to talk a little bit about biogeography, I think, next week. Uh, so basically, we started here with individuals, populations, and species, talking about evolution. And now we're kind of moving up to this idea of communities and ecosystems, moving from down here with individual interactions, community interactions, moving more up to larger scale ecosystem interactions. And then the last thing is this legal disclaimer. You don't need to worry about it. It won't be on the test, but I just have to put it in the video. So I hope that was enjoyable. I hope everyone is staying safe. I hope everyone is social distancing and trying to flatten the curve. And if you like the video, hit the like, subscribe, share, and I will see you next time. But first, I've got to shut the video off. And bye.